this morning from uh, St Andrew's Walker. I'm glad uh, you're able to join us uh, this morning. Uh, As we come together today, it's right and good, isn't it, that we spend time focusing on God, thinking about his character, uh, thinking about uh, his promises, thinking about uh, his commands and actions in our world. Uh, The word of God is our wisdom, uh, our guide for life, our guide for understanding the world around us. 
It's great to be able to come to the Word of God this morning and hear God speak to us and seek to understand what He has to say to us about ourselves and about our world. As we come to the Bible, we understand truths like the idea that we have equal dignity in the eyes of God as those who are made in His image, equally loved by Him in the sending of His Son, Jesus Christ, into the world. <clears throat> Strange not being able to meet uh, with each other in each other's presence this morning. But we understand even so that's the case, that we come from different backgrounds. We come from different stages of life, uh, different ethnic backgrounds. And yet through faith in Jesus Christ, the Bible teaches us that we are united. We are one as a body of believers. <clears throat> it's a privilege to know these truths through the Bible, isn't it? And we're going to be focusing more on God's Word this morning as we come to look at uh, Matthew chapter 6 again uh, and the Lord's Prayer and also thinking about uh, God's Word and what it means uh, for our lives in a, in a broader context. So let's spend some time looking at God's Word now together. Let me read for us from Psalm 84. A Psalm of David. Now for the choir director, a psalm of the sorry, a psalm of the sons of Korah. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord of armies. I long and yearn for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even a sparrow finds a home and a swallow a nest for herself where she places her young. Near her altars, Lord of armies, my King and my God. How happy are those who reside in your house, who praise you continually. Happy are the people whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Bacar, they make it a source of spring water. Even the autumn rain will cover it with blessings. They go from strength to strength. Each appears before God in Zion. Lord of armies, hear my prayer. Listen, God of Jacob. Consider our shield, God. Look on the face of your anointed one. Better a day in your courts than a thousand anywhere else. I'd rather stand at the threshold of the house of my God than live in the tents of the wicked people. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord grants favour and honour. He does not withhold the good from those who live with integrity. Happy is the person who trusts in you, Lord of armies. Let me pray for our time together this morning now. Let me pray. Almighty God, thank you that you have made each one of us equal before you in your image, equal in dignity, equally loved in the sending of Jesus into the world for us. You know our hearts and nothing can be hidden from you. We thank you that every day we live in your presence and that through your word we can know you and know what it means to honour you. We pray that by your Holy Spirit, you would please cleanse our thoughts and desires so that we may truly love you and bring honour to your name. We pray these things through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, let's sing together now. Thanks for that, Ben. Uh, right now we're going to sing uh, This Is Amazing Grace. <laughs> Who brings a 
Jesus Christ said that we're to love our Lord, our God, with all our heart and all our soul, with all our mind and with all our strength. This is the thirdest and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbour as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments, Jesus said. And yet, sadly, we fail to honour God as we should, don't we? And we fail to respond to his love for us as we should. And so admitting our guilt and trusting in God, it's right for us to confess our sins to him, trusting in his mercy and grace to forgive us. So let's pray together now uh, this prayer of confession. Let's pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have gone our own way, not loving you as we ought nor loving our neighbour as ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word and deed, and in what we have failed to do. We deserve your condemnation. Father, forgive us. Help us to love you and our neighbour and to live for your honour and glory. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let me continue in prayer for us. Merciful Father, we rejoice that you pardon and forgive those who truly repent and trust in your Son. Deliver us from our sins. Confirm and strengthen us in all goodness and keep us in eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. As we suggested earlier, the Word of God, uh, the Bible is our source of wisdom for knowing God our source of wisdom for knowing what it means to to honour him in our lives and in the world that he's given us. Uh, In terms times of turmoil, especially as we face the reality of a lot of places in our world uh, struggling with civil unrest, it's great to come back to the word of God as a solid foundation, wisdom that doesn't change, wisdom that doesn't shift and understand what it is that God talks to us about in his word and and what we believe about him. So let's remind ourselves, let's encourage each other with these words of belief uh, that we'll say together, uh, these words of this creed. Now let's say together these words. What do we believe? We believe in one God who made us and loves all that is, We believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, 
who was born, lived, died and rose again and is coming to call all to account. We believe in the Holy Spirit who calls, equips and sends out God's people and brings all things to their true end. This is our faith, the faith of the church. We believe in one God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. We're just about to look at God's word together now, so please have open uh, in your Bibles Hebrews chapter 4 as it's read for us. Good morning, everybody. We're going to read from Hebrews chapter 4. Therefore, since the promise to enter his rest remains, let us beware that none of you be found to have fallen short. For we also have received the good news just as they did. But the message they heard did not benefit them, since they were not united with those who heard it in faith. For we who have believed enter the rest. So in keeping with what he has said, so I swore in my anger they will not enter my rest, even though his works have been finished since the foundation of the world. For somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day in this way, and on the seventh day God rested from all his works. Again, in that passage, he says, they will never enter my rest. Therefore, since it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news did not enter because of disobedience, he again specifies a certain day, today. He specified this speaking through David after such a long time. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. Therefore, a Sabbath, rest remain, a Sabbath rest remains for God's people. For the person who has entered his rest has rested from his own works, just as God did from his. Let us then make every effort to enter that rest, so that no one will fall into the same pattern of disobedience. For the word of God is living and effective and sharper than any double-edged set a double-edged sword penetrating as far as the separation of soul and spirit joints and marrow it is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart no creature is hidden from him but all things are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account therefore since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathise with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in every way, as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in time of need. Well, thanks, Ruth, for reading uh, for us this morning. Uh, this morning, as I mentioned already, we're finishing off our sermon series uh, in the book of Matthew, looking at the Lord's Prayer together. Uh, the Bishop of our Diocese, Rick Lewis, will uh, be preaching for us this morning on that last part of the Lord's Prayer. Next week, we're starting a sermon series on the book of Daniel. Uh, you may want to read uh, a bit of Daniel in advance just to get your head around what's happening in that book as we prepare to look at it uh, together. But right now, please open in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6 and verse 9 uh, as we spend some time considering the Lord's Prayer together. It is good to be with you again and uh, I want you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 6 and I'm going to read from verse 9. It is our reading it has been for the five times we've been together as we've been looking at the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Therefore, you should pray like this. Our Father in heaven, your name be honoured as holy. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us into temptation but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. 
Uh, this talk today concludes our talks on the Lord's Prayer. Attention to this prayer has given me just such a good pattern for my prayers, hopefully for yours too. The pattern of prayer given by Jesus has also served to teach me some controls on how I should pray and what I should pray for and what I shouldn't pray for. But more than this, the petition of this prayer has given me great confidence to pray as I've been invited by Jesus to ask these many things of my Heavenly Father. Every petition in the prayer, interestingly, promises something that is already true, already done, already completed, something God is already committed to. God's name, it will be hallowed. God's kingdom will come. His will is to be done. He does give us our daily bread and he's already granted us forgiveness through the extraordinary kindness, grace and mercy of Jesus who bore our sins in his body on the cross. We have seen as we've opened up this prayer over the weeks past a kind of presentation of uh, the prayer that uh, I was wonderfully helped by John MacArthur Jr. to see. We have seen the paternity of the prayer, the priority, program, provision and pardon of this prayer. And in truth, the premium has been paid to pray, to pay, pray. It's been paid for by Jesus. The policy is ours. All we have to do is make the claim to be a praying people, to ask of God's providence the treasures of this prayer. We are indeed a blessed people. It's great news, this prayer, but in the last petition of this prayer is even greater promise for us. For in the last petition, we see the protection of this prayer. But protection from what? Well, in the context of this prayer, I think it has to be protection from losing all that Jesus has taught us to pray thus far. <laughs> I, I got to say, as I think about that, I, I want to be protected from the kinds of things that may distance me from the sweetness of relationship with my Heavenly Father. I want protection from those things that prevent God's kingdom being established in me. I want protection from not doing the will of God, which of course would be sin, which has never done me any good, hasn't done anyone any good. I want protection from my life being starved, of course, by a lack of my daily bread. And I want protection from the bitterness that comes from being unforgiven and worse sometimes of being unforgiving. Security is everything these days, and it's everything in the Christian life. And I want to know that the things of heaven are secure. That I am absolutely secure in our Father's kingdom, and I want that security protected. So it's no wonder for me that Jesus teaches us in a prayer for disciples to pray for God's protection. It's no surprise to me either that Jesus ultimately in Matthew's gospel becomes the greatest protection ever given to humanity. As Jesus stands in your place and mine, as the one who bears our sins, takes on the wrath of God and sets us free to be God's adopted children. But this petition, this petition at the end of the prayer needs some unpacking. Uh, you see, some of us may well have felt that in life, little has been offered by way of protection. Perhaps the feeling of some would be more one of absolute vulnerability. Too many trials, far too much temptation and only sad results. And we could list them. In fact, some are listed in Jesus' sermon, some of the sad results. There is unresolved anger. There's adultery. There's the lust of the eye, which is in epidemic proportions today. 
as men and women struggle with pornography. We ought to be praying for one another, actually, when it comes to pornography in this these days of COVID-19, as people are shut away uh, from uh, their community, from other people, because in the loneliness and the isolation, there may be great temptations to go to one's computer and look into a dark world from which only God can save us. Only God can return us from it. We need to pray for people that they don't go there. Every person knows the temptations that arise in times of trial, don't they? And every one of us knows what it is to surrender to the temptation and to sin. <laughs> the Bible makes very clear that all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We haven't acted the way we should and we're in desperate need of God's protections. In the part of the, part of the Lord's Prayer we're looking at, it deals with just these things. It speaks of trials. It knows the danger of trials. And Jesus invites us to pray for God's protection. Now, as a person having learnt the Lord's Prayer off by heart as a little boy, I was a little annoyed when the alternative to lead us not into temptation was presented as save us from the time of trial. Changes can be a little confusing, can't they? For a start, in the opening verse of the epistle of James, he says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance and more. At that point, trials seem to be actually good at bringing about our sanctification. So why would we pray? save us from trial. And then in uh, the same chapter of James, James 1 verse 13, he writes, When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. So then how do we pray? Lead us not into temptation if God doesn't tempt anyone. Perhaps a brief trip back to the temptations of Jesus in Matthew 4 might be helpful at this point. There the problem was not the trial so much. The problem was always the evil one and the temptations he raised in the midst of the trial for Jesus to deny God's word. Hence, I think, the entirety of this protective request. In trial or in temptation, lead us not into temptation and deliver us from the evil one. The one who would actually have us deny the very word of God. Some trials honour God and help you to become mature. But trials are not trials, are they, by name alone. They are trials by reputation. In fact, I can relate to the person who said, I try to take one day at a time, but sometimes several days attack me at once. I think most of us could probably understand that experience. And, and it's at this point, I think this petition is pretty emotionally charged and a very sensible request at the end of this prayer. You see, we live amidst clashing kingdoms and wills that bring trials and temptations for us every day of our Christian lives. Receiving our daily bread can be a trial that issues in temptations to grasp when we don't have enough and, interestingly, to keep grasping when we desire more. Trial is a good word too, to describe forgiveness. Because the temptation to pride, to not admit that we need forgiveness, is a problem. And the pride, the temptation to pride, to not extend forgiveness to others, is again enormous. 
trials, it seems, inevitably attract temptations. And have us fall into the evil one's kind of capacities. Perhaps this is where we see the connection between the two translations here. Lead us not into temptation and save us from the time of trial. I don't think we want to hold them apart. We want to bring them together. You see, I cannot count the number of times I have trudged to the living room of my Heavenly Father's discipline with the bowed head of shame to fess up to him that I have failed under trial. I love my Heavenly Father, I always have. And like any child who loves their dad, I have found the guilt of my failures to be intolerable load to carry. And I don't think I'm alone in that today. And I want to be protected from that. In a world where, under trial, the evil one is constantly at work to tempt me to not trust God, but to perhaps lean on my own understanding or the understanding of the false. My experience is that life is full of trials that present us with two kinds of doors. A door called faith that leads to obedience, godly character, and eternal life. And then there's a door called temptation that can so easily in that life of faith lead us into sin. And if not correctly dealt with, potentially, the wages of death. This prayer responds to both these doors, it seems to me. This prayer pours forth from the heart of faith that longs to please God, that longs with every breath to reflect the Father's holy character. Indeed, as we pray, lead us not into temptation, you reflect back. Oh God, I want to hallow your name. And yet this prayer also, as it pours forth this heart of faith, this prayer pours forth an understanding of ourselves that actually recognises our weaknesses and the ease with which we can give way to sin and the cleverness of the evil one. And this prayer invites us in our weakness to retreat to the protection of a Heavenly Father. But this prayer is heard by the Father, worth noticing that, who invites us to pray for His protection. What an invitation. And our asking finds its answer in the providence of the God we depend upon. And in the providence of God, here's what he's given. We have a magnificent prayer taught to us by the one who is the king of the kingdom, who does the will of God perfectly, the one who is the bread of life, the sacrifice of God for the forgiveness of our sins, the one who, having ascended into heaven, left us, but poured out his Holy Spirit on us to work in us and through us and for us. The seal of our protection and the promise of the glorious inheritance that awaits us. What a magnificent prayer. It sets for us the pattern for our own prayers, reminding us of the paternity of our Father. The priority that God's name be hallowed. The program that his king, kingdom come and his will be done. The provision of our daily bread. 
the pardon of our forgiveness and the protection against all the wiles of the evil one who would tempt us away from our Heavenly Father. Of course, this prayer ultimately points to the glorious reality of heaven, doesn't it? When God's name will be hallowed, as every knee will bow and tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This prayer points to when the kingdom of righteousness will reign and the will of God will be done perfectly. A day when all causes of evil and all doers of evil will be done away with so that God's people might shine like the sun in the kingdom of the Father. This prayer points to the day when we will sit at table with God and have him serve us our daily bread from the bounty of his heavenly pantry. When we live in God's presence, this prayer tells us that we can be assured of forgiveness and in heaven will be gone any harboured bitterness towards each other. And this prayer points to the day that is yet ahead, a day when protection of our relationship with God, with God will reach its ultimate goal, a day when trials will be over, temptations no more, and sin will be as foreign to us then as perhaps our understanding of the glory of God is to us now. And all God's people prayed with me. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. May God help you in your prayers. May this, the Lord's taught prayer, help you daily. And may God protect you and comfort you in our journey towards being in his eternal presence. Amen. We now are going to spend some time praying to our Heavenly Father. Dear God, before we lift our needs or speak a word, help us to bring our hearts before you. Help us to praise you. Help us to know you. Help us to feel your joy. Let us hear your voice and help us to seek you first. We give thanks and worship you this morning. We thank you that you are a holy and loving God who cares more about us than we will ever know. We also give thanks for family. We give thanks for marriage. We give thanks for friends. We give thanks for schools. We give thanks for employment. We give thanks for rain. We give thanks for Walker. We give thanks for animals and we give thanks for your beautiful creation. Faithful Father, thank you that you can satisfy our every desire and need. Let us give thanks to you for your unfailing love. Even when we stuff up, you still love us the same. Remind us that we lack nothing when we choose to follow you. Help us to find fulfillment and satisfaction of life always in you. We give thanks for our church here in Walker. It is so strange to not meet in a building each week, but we thank you that your spirit is alive and growing within our church family. We ask that you'll continue to grow our yearning and love for you, that you will start a fire in our souls, that it will burn so brightly that everyone around us can see you in our daily lives. We pray that we take opportunities to share your great news with those around us, and that you're glorified by how we conduct ourselves. We especially pray for those reflecting and seeking your greater purpose in life at the moment. Please allow them to know you. Please use us in conversations and situations to help point people to you. We know that you are the answer our world needs, and we pray that you will be 
that there will be a wave of new followers in the months to come. Thank you, Father, for Australia. We thank you that we have been lucky to have such low numbers of confirmed COVID-19 cases compared to so many places around the world. Father God, we bring before you this morning the sick, the homeless, the mourning and the suffering. We pray especially for those who have and those who will continue who continue to suffer domestic violence as a result of COVID-19. We know unemployment, the shutdowns and substance abuse creates a horrible mix that puts vulnerable members of the community at greater risk. We pray that they seek a way out. We pray that adults and children alike in these situations speak up. Give them the source they need to press on with life. Put Christian people in their paths and help us to recognise these people in our community. Bring them into relationship with you. We give thanks for the rain that has come in the past months and pray that farmers especially will rejoice and praise you. Especially um, noticing the contrast to last year. Knowing this provision came from your hands, not luck or mother nature, but that you truly care for them and that you sent the rain to nourish the land. Lord, as we go into our weeks ahead, we pray that you can remind us that even when we don't feel or see it, you are working in this world, that you never stop working because you are a way maker, a miracle worker, a promise keeper. You're the light in the darkness and for this we can be so thankful. And we pray all these things in your mighty name. Amen. Light in the darkness, my
we come to finish our time uh, together this morning, I wonder uh, what it is that you've been most impacted by by what we've looked at uh, this morning. What is it that you've been encouraged by or about in your Christian life? Maybe it is something that we've read from God's Word. Uh, Maybe it's something that you've heard from from Matthew chapter 6, as we've heard it explained to us. Maybe it's one of the songs that we've sung this morning that's really resonated with you or, or some of the prayers that we've prayed. I wonder what it is that you're going to take away from our time this morning and, and dwell upon and, and seek to put into practice uh, in your life. It's a, a great question to ask ourselves, isn't it? Uh, and to, to dwell upon and, and also have conversations with uh, those around us who we can encourage in faith and ask them the same question. What is it that you've been impacted by this morning? What what are you going to put into practice uh, in your life uh, this week? Well, as we finish up, uh, let me pray uh, for us uh, that we will have God working in our hearts uh, and helping us to grow uh, in our lives uh, by his Holy Spirit. Uh, Let me pray. Heavenly Father, We pray you'd help us to understand the privilege that it is to know you as our God, our loving, caring, wise, forgiving, gracious God who hears our prayers and who has worked and is working in our world for our good. You, Lord God, are our hope and strength. Thank you for this time together that we've just spent focusing on you, praising you and seeking to understand what it means to honour you in our lives. Through your Holy Spirit, please deepen our trust in you. Please give us joy in knowing you. Please renew our strength to serve you. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us uh, this morning. I do pray that God will be watching over you and at work in your heart as you go forward into the week ahead. Thank you. Thank you.